A beautiful day in the neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor, won't you be mine? Here we go, Higher Side Chatters, drink a little drink, smoking a little smoke. From sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and I am really looking forward to delivering today's little bonus show to you because it isn't about speculation and hearsay. This is about a specific widespread network of child pedophilia and trafficking that was boldly swept under the rug and quarantined to protect high-ranking politicians and government officials that not only want to avoid prosecutions for their previous crimes, but also just want to continue molesting kids and abusing their power. And I'm sure many of them still are, because again, nobody was found guilty, so why would they really stop? There is no plus show, and originally this was going to be just a bonus episode for subscribers, but... I would not feel right doing that in this circumstance on a subject that has already had a hard enough time getting the exposure it deserves, so I just wanted to let you know what was going on with that before we dive in, but here's my talk with a guy who deserves a lot more credit than he's getting, Nick Bryan, on The Franklin Scandal. Sweet dreams to the elite, we're calling them out on THC, uncovering secrets and conspiracies. Everybody's looking for something Some of them want to use you Some of them want to get used by you Some of them want to abuse you Some of them want to be abused All right, people, we hear rumors of pedophile networks among the elite, and sometimes this darkness is briefly exposed to light, only to have powerful people circle the wagons and lock down the situation until it blows over and slips silently back into the shadows. Well, today's guest has fought the noble fight against these people for a long time, and as a journalist, author, and a hero, quite frankly, he's done more than most. And the culmination of this work comes in the form of the thickest and most detailed book on my shelf, The Franklin Scandal, a story about power brokers, child abuse, and betrayal. Nick was kind enough to join me for a little while today to talk about it, and I couldn't be more honored. Nick, welcome to THC. Well, thank you for having me, Greg. Yeah, man. I mean, the pleasure's mine. Thank you so much for not only being here, but for all your hard work and dedication on this topic. From what I understand, you put seven years and over 40,000 miles of travel into The Franklin Scandal, which should be impressive to anybody listening. So I just have to tell you how much I respect and admire you for that. But for people who might be hearing about this case for the first time, can you give them a little background on this saga and why it's called the Franklin Scandal? Well, the Franklin Scandal is about an interstate pedophile network that flew children from coast to coast and pandered them to the rich and powerful. And it was ultimately covered up by various facets of the federal government, including the Department of Justice, FBI, and Secret Service. And it gets its name because a front for the this pedophile network was the Franklin Federal Credit Union in Omaha, Nebraska. So that's why it is called the Franklin Scandal. This uh, credit union was essentially a front for this pedophile network. So one of the major players involved, probably the apex of the situation, is this guy, Larry King. Can you tell us a little bit about him? Lawrence E. King was the manager of the Franklin Credit Union and also uh, one of the ringleaders of this pedophile network. He had a second, there was a second ringleader named uh, Craig Spence, lived in Washington, D.C. But Lawrence E. King uh, plundered the Omaha area for kids, he plundered Boys Town. He plundered the foster care system, and then he acquired kids that just kind of fell through the cracks, runaways, and uh, kids that uh, were generally from extremely dysfunctional families. And he was the centerpiece for flying the kids from coast to coast and also uh, involving them in child pornography and other nefarious activities. Everything malevolent that you can do to a child, Lawrence King has done to a child. 
Yeah, it is definitely a, a sad saga and shocking in, in so many different areas. But how big do you assess this particular ring was? How many children do you think have been used by this group? It was in operation for probably a decade. Dozens and dozens of children. Uh, as I said, it had a pipeline of children from Boys Town, the distinguished court orphanage on the outskirts of Omaha, Nebraska. But they were getting children from other milieus, and they had quite a, a rapacious appetite for children. And the Franklin scandal really documents just about every modality that a predator can uh, prey on a child, from orphanages to foster care. Of course, there is a lot of just abuse of power and people who are just sexually deviant, but a lot of this story also involves getting powerful people in compromising positions so that they can be controlled and blackmailed by holding it over their head that they've been having sex with children. Is that right? Yes, that's where Craig Spence comes in. He was Lawrence E. King's partner in this pedophilic pan pandering enterprise. And he lived in Washington, D.C., and he had a house that was wired for audiovisual blackmail in Washington, D.C., and a lot of the pedophilic parties would go down in Craig Spencer's upscale D.C. house, and people that had inclinations for any type of sex, sexual object, or illicit drugs would be provided with them, and then they would subsequently be blackmailed. And um, there's a, there was a lot of documentation uh, gathered by the uh, Washington Times on Craig Spence's blackmail enterprise. And the Washington Post uh, played a real integral role in covering this up along with various branches of federal law enforcement. So to get into your book a little bit, a large part of it is this chapter about the investigation done by a highly skilled private investigator, this Gary Caradori guy. Can you tell us about his part in all this? Yes. Well. What what happened in the Franklin scandal is people personnel in social services were aware of King's interstate pedophile network and his pandering of children. And these social services personnel went to law enforcement in Nebraska, both federal and state law enforcement, and asked them to investigate. And they were just simply ignored. There was, there was no investigation whatsoever carried out. And um, so ultimately, what happened was Lawrence E. King got busted embezzling $40 million from the Franklin Credit Union. And a Nebraska Senate subcommittee was formed to look into King's embezzlement of this money because the Franklin Credit Union had been audited in four years. And they thought, and it was a, it was a credit union that dealt with lower socioeconomic people. So the fact that it was supposed to have 2.5 million in it. So the fact that King had looted it for 40 million and he hadn't been audited in four years because he ran a federally insured credit union, which requires an audit yearly. So the Senate subcommittee formed to look into the financial crimes of Lawrence e. King. And when they formed, social services personnel went to the senators on this committee and said, King's looting of the Franklin Credit Union is only part of the story. He's also responsible for pandering children and trafficking children and child pornography. So the Senate subcommittee started to look into those allegations and they hired a very good private investigator named Gary Caradori. And he started uh, finding new victims and recording their testimony on, on videotape. And he started actually really starting to break it open. And if the dominoes would have started falling in Omaha, Nebraska, they would have fallen all the way to Washington, D.C. It was something that had to be covered up at all costs. In my book, Gary Caradori, when he started video recording these kids that would come forward, the media would just demolish the kids' credibility. Um, it was very... It was very uh, it was it was very, very um, obvious that the media had a vested interest in covering this up. Hmm. So ultimately what happened was there was a photographer who worked for King who did job pornography and I think also took blackmail pictures. 
he had a falling out with King, and he met Gary Caridori in Chicago and gave him pictures that would have busted this thing wide open, and um, and it would have really jeopardized, I think, the Bush one administration. Mm-hmm. And um, and Caridori was flying back from Chicago to Nebraska with these pictures, and his plane mysteriously broke up in midair, and the pictures were never recovered. And then a, a state and a federal grand jury declared that there was no child abuse uh, within. Well, the state grand jury declared that there was no child abuse at all within two weeks of Gary, Gary Caridori's plane crash. So ultimately, Gary Caridori was like the first piece of covering this up, getting getting rid of Gary Caridori. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And then this guy William Colby investigated his death and was pretty sure. There was foul play involved in Caridori's death, but would only say so off the record, which is unfortunate. But tell us a little bit about Colby. He was a CIA director, too, wasn't he? Up until 1976, when he was deposed and Gerald Ford installed uh, George Herbert Walker Bush. Now, the Franklin Committee hired William Colby to, to investigate Gary Caridori's death. I mean, and this was in 1990, and uh, Colby died some years after that. But Colby didn't publicly state that Gary Caridori had been murdered, but he privately told people that were affiliated with the investigation that Gary Caridori had been murdered. But six years later, uh, Colby died under very mysterious circumstances. But that was six years following the, the Franklin cover-up. Right, probably not directly related, but I'm sure there are a thousand reasons to knock off an ex-CIA director. Apparently, he took his kayak out with half his dinner still on the table and was never found again. So yeah, definitely suspicious. But getting back to this case and your book, I mean, you know you're researching something that at least one other person died investigating. This had to be a little bit scary, and you did encounter quite a bit of trouble along the way, wouldn't you say? Well, I uh, I had a death threat when I first went to Nebraska, and I had a lot. Of, I've had a lot of heat put on me. I too went for pictures like Gary Caridori with Rusty Nelson. Rusty Nelson isn't the most ethical of individuals, and he kind of took me out a wild goose chase. But when I was driving Rusty Nelson home after this wild goose chase, we were pulled over and I was summarily deposited in a police car and my car was then just completely ripped apart, my rental car. So, yeah, there were a number of, and then there's been, uh, certainly there's been phone harassment too. So, yes, I, I was subjected to to a lot of heat as I investigated the Franklin scale. Yeah, I mean, harassment, intimidation. It's so sad to see someone doing such a noble thing and and facing such negative consequences. And it's a very heroic task, man. You were even so bold as to break the law with some of the documents you included in the book, didn't you? Yes, uh, one of the grand juries was really, really corrupt. Well, actually, there were two grand juries that were really, really corrupt in Omaha. And then there was a grand jury that was really, really corrupt in Washington, D.C. And, um... I managed to get the sealed grand jury testimony of one of the very corrupt grand juries in Nebraska that declared that all the child abuse allegations were carefully crafted hoax. And I published grand jury transcripts in the Franklin scandal, which was, which is illegal for me to do. I mean, you're not allowed to publish grand jury transcripts and I could have been arrested any day since that book has been published. (laughs) Yeah, that's a bold move, but I agree with your assessment that this case, they obviously want to bury this case. They don't want to draw attention to anyone who's researching it, and so I think you made a a calculated decision that ended up benefiting you in your favor because you faced no repercussions because they just can't risk the attention to the case. Yes, that's the thing. If they arrested me, then they would bring a lot of attention to this case. Mm -hmm. If if law enforcement arrested me, they'd bring a lot of attention to this case. So until it starts to receive more attention, I think I'll be unscathed for uh, publishing seal grand jury transcripts. Yeah, and I do want to get into some of the details of the case itself. Some of the things that these kids said had happened to them. You know, this one kid, Bonner, said that uh, a guy had put cigarettes out on him during sex. Another girl 
Shanita Moore uh, was picked up from the Omaha Girls Club at nine years old and used in satanic parties. Uh, you also wrote about some of these kids being sent around on commercial flights to smuggle drugs for some of these guys. Definitely pretty dark stuff. They use these kids for all kinds of stuff. And a lot of these pedophiles, these were very powerful pedophiles that these kids were pandered to. A lot of the pedophiles were. And they did unbelievably sadistic things to these kids. I mean, unbelievably sadistic things. And the kids that I've talked to, all of them had very sadistic things done to them. So it's really, uh, it's, it's, it's very tragic that these kids have to live not only with physical scar scars, but with these deep emotional scars of being molested with impunity. And, and they were, all, the, all these kids were, as I said earlier, state and federal law enforcement concluded that not a single child had been abused. So all these kids were essentially molested with impunity. Yeah. And another thing that surprised me was the fact that you were able to actually get an interview with this one guy who ran an escort service for Craig Spence. He really wanted to stick to providing over 18 escorts, but it seems like they came on pretty hard to get him to provide children, didn't they? That gentleman and I, his name is Henry Vincent. He and I co-authored a book called uh, Confessions of a DC Man, The Politics of Sex, Lies, and Blackmail. That's come out this month. And he uh, ran an escort service in Washington, D.C. Craig Spence would provide, but he only, his escorts were all adults. He didn't provide children. Right. And um, Craig Spence spent up to $20,000 a month on escorts at his escort service. And these parties that were in Washington, D.C., if you wanted young men in their early 20s or young women in their early 20s or children, I mean, whatever you wanted, you'd be provided with. So that's how Henry Vincent got hooked up with Craig Spence because Craig, he became Craig Spence's go-to guy for male escorts. And yes, they put a lot of pressure on him to ride them with children, but he refused to do that. And, um, mm -hmm. and, he, and he too had to pay a price for that. But how these parties would generally work is Craig Spence would have a who's who of the Washington elite there. And they would... There would be a cocktail party, It'd be a Washington, D.C. cocktail party. And people would be getting lubricated on alcohol. And then at a certain hour, maybe 10 o'clock or 11, after people had been suitably lubricated on alcohol, um, something sexually inappropriate would happen or someone would break out some cocaine and maybe fire up a joint. Mm -hmm. And people that were adverse to that would leave. And then people that wanted to partake of, of whatever Spence had would stay and then they would ultimately be compromised because of this house was wired for audio visual black as I mentioned. You know, a lot of this stuff in a lot of ways doesn't surprise me, but the devil is really in the details. And I was shocked more than once in this saga just how bold the actions of these people can be and how the entire legal system seems to tip in their favor to a dumbfounding degree whenever the pressure is on them. And there are many aspects of the trial that highlight this unfairness. Can you tell us about some of that? <laughs> Well, there were two kids that the FBI came in and got really heavy with the kids. And the kids recanted their abuse, but two kids refused to. And uh, one was Alicia Owen and one was Paul Benassi. And Alicia was indicted on eight counts of perjury by a state grand jury. And Paul was indicted on three counts of perjury by a state grand jury. Now, each one of these perjury counts had 20 years. So Alicia was looking at uh, uh, 160 years, and Paul was looking at 60 years. And Alicia was also ultimately also indicted uh, on eight counts of perjury from a federal grand jury. So she, and here's a kid that's 21 years old um, and who was you know, pretty brutally molested uh, in her adolescence. So she was ultimately facing 16 counts of perjury and looking at uh, well over or nearly 300 years in prison. So, um, and ultimately it came down to the state going after Alicia in a trial because these corrupt grand juries had declared that there was no child abuse and indicted the victims who wouldn't the cancer abuse on perjury. So, for these grand juries to be validated, they, they had to get convictions. And the Leach's trial is the biggest chapter of my book because I really show how 
the state law enforcement and how federal law enforcement just pulled out all the stops to corrupt her jury and uh, or to corrupt her uh, ca- court case and um and there, there was all kinds of malfeasance with the judge with the prosecutor with the jury and uh after three days of deliberation she was ultimately sentenced uh convicted on perjury and sentenced to to an unbelievable nine to fifteen years in prison for perjury a kid and she also spent nearly two years in solitary confinement which is kind of mind-boggling to do that to a kid Right. That was the kind of the saddest element of the whole case for me and the most shocking. Alicia Owen, two years in solitary confinement and, you know, even more in prison. It's just like that. That's what you get for being raped. I mean, how do you not feel like the entire world is against you? You're swept up in this pedophile ring as a child. Every adult you're involved with is abusing you in the worst ways. Then you finally try to get some honest people and and speak out about it. And this is how you're rewarded. I mean, this has got to be, from her perspective, the entire world is against her. That is just one of the saddest elements of the whole thing. The Ellen Jones story is very tragic, but it's kind of interesting. Both the kids that refused to recant their abuse, Paul Benassi and Alicia Owen, they've actually forged lives for themselves. I mean, Alicia did her time, and uh, she's happily married. She's got a good job, a good career. She's got the love of her family. And uh, and Paul has got a, a wonderful wife and and three kids and uh he's got his own business and uh so there's some poetic justice there that Mm -hmm. these kids that refused to recant their abuse ultimately were able to forge good lives for themselves so it's kind of remarkable actually it is and there's a little bit of a of an irony in the fact that the two who wouldn't recant their testimony seem to have uh, the most productive lives and then but several of the other kids, this really sent them into a downward spiral of drugs and worse, right? Yeah, all the kids, uh, that was like one of the carrots that were, if the kids performed adequately, they'd be given money and drugs. So ultimately, it's, it's really a, a, a perfect system because these kids are molested at a very young age and turned on to drugs at a very young age. And then at a certain point, they use they lose their useful marketability, and then they're just expunged. And then, so you ultimately have kids that were molested at a very young age and have very low self esteem to no self esteem, and they're also drug addicts, and they go on to commit crimes, mm-hmm. and thereby completely compromise their own credibility. So if they come forward, law enforcement can say, "Well, we can't believe this person because." He did X, Y, and Z. And so it's really a perfect system to get these kids young, molest them, and turn them on to drugs, and then let them compromise their own credibility once they've lost their youthful marketability. And credibility-wise, it's a first-round TKO. I mean, no one's, no one's going to believe the kid that's fallen into various criminal enterprises and drug addiction. And I've also heard you say that a grand jury is the perfect type of trial to to use if you want to have a corrupt case and, you know, you want to protect some people. Why is that? I think people might be surprised to to hear that. Well, people have a misconception about grand juries. Uh, they think that grand juries, I mean, grand jury, grand jury sounds like, <laughs> like the gods from Mount Olympus have spoken and sat down a decree. <laughs> right. The grand juries are rather infamous because they can be easily corrupted. Actually, uh, new, uh, new, a chief New York state appellate judge once said special prosecutors have so much power over grand juries that they could get a grand jury to indict a ham sandwich. <laughs> and what he meant by that is someone has appointed a special prosecutor of a grand jury. Now, grand jurors are just regular citizens that have shown up for jury duty that have been funneled into a grand jury. So there's, there's nothing special about them. They're just regular citizens that have shown up for jury duty. And it's up to a, a, a special prosecutor of a grand jury to present evidence and witnesses that he deems uh, relevant to the grand jurors. So only witnesses and evidence that he deems relevant is shown to the grand jurors, and that's how they make their decision of whether to indict or not to indict. 
So in the case of Franklin, the special prosecutor of the state grand jury, Samuel Van Pelt, called people that made the children look like they were lying and made the perpetrators look like they were telling the truth. Hmm. And that's why no perpetrators were indicted. And the kids that refused to recant their abuse were indicted for perjury is because he, because of the witnesses that he called it. And in the book, I show how he definitely manipulates evidence that he definitely manipulated evidence. And, uh, there was all types of, all kinds of malfeasance involved in that grand jury. Yeah. One detail, the grand jury wasn't even shown the full video testimonies of the kids. They had been edited down, right? Yes, Gary Curidori, the prosecutor that was hired by the uh, Nebraska Senate, he recorded the ki- the victims that he found on videotape. And the video testimony that was shown to the grand jurors had been edited out so the kids didn't corroborate, corroborate each other. The kids with Gary Curidori's t- uh, original tapes repeatedly corroborated each other. But uh, when they were shown to the grand jurors, all that had been edited out. And there's also a disturbing element in this story of a lot of people who helped in covering up this situation and making sure the trial went the way they wanted it to go. A lot of these people ended up getting promotions later on. Isn't that true? Yes, uh, that's what's really, uh, that's uh, another disturbing element of this case. Lawrence King was deposited in a mental institution. They had to get him out of town for these two grand juries so he wouldn't be called. So he was deposited in a mental institution. Now, the U.S. magistrate that did that and also did some other things that helped cover up Franklin, he became a U.S. District Court judge. Hmm. The uh, assistant U.S. attorney for Nebraska that was the special prosecutor of this federal grand jury that found that there was no child abuse, he is now a U.S. magistrate. Wow. The prosecutor that oversaw Alicia Owen getting found guilty of perjury, and that was a very, very corrupt trial. He became a Douglas County, uh, Omaha is in Douglas County, a Douglas County District Court judge. And the prosecutor that ensured that Alicia Owen stayed in prison, he's now an assistant U.S. attorney. And on the D.C. side of it, the U.S. attorney that helped cover the D.C. side of this, because it had a big D.C. side to it. He was an associate attorney general, and now he's a vice president of the Raytheon Corporation, which is one of the largest defense contractors in the world. Right. And Henry Vinson was represented by Greta Van Susteren, and she really didn't do an adequate job, according to Henry Vinson, representing him, because everything that the government wanted to accomplish, they accomplished his silence and his imprisonment. And after that, she became quite a television celebrity, and now she's got her own new show on Fox television. Yeah. And you had mentioned the media's role in this a little bit, but not not only at the time was the media kind of not covering the story, but it's also a little curious that your book has never been picked up by someone like Oprah or Nancy Grace, who are supposed to be champions of this type of thing. Well, Oprah, uh, three of Oprah's producers have my book, and uh, one of Nancy Grace's producers has my book, but they won't touch it. And Nancy Grace pretends to be like an advocate of abused girls, but she hasn't touched Jeffrey Epstein, who was the power broker that was flying young girls around uh, that's recently hit the news. And I wrote a, an article about it in Gawker. Your uh, listeners can go to Nick Bryant and Google Nick Bryant and Gawker. And I wrote a couple of articles on Epstein. So Nancy Grace and Oprah are, uh, they're hypocrites of the worst order where they put a lot of lip service into uh, preventing child abuse. But when they're confronted with really whole scale widespread child abuse they uh they tend to cower like most people it's definitely sad and you've actually covered and investigated several other pedophile rings since not only this one and the one you just mentioned but a couple others too well i've been working on jeffrey epstein and that pedophile network and the jeffrey epstein case is similar to franklin in that jeffrey epstein molested god knows how many children and he also 
handed them out to his rich and powerful cronies. And ultimately, really nothing happened. He spent uh, 13 months in a county jail, and he only had to spend nights there. And and that was a corrupt grand jury, too, that uh, found that he hadn't molested a single child when the Palm Beach Police Department had put together, had five victims of his, and they had this, the sworn testimony of a number of people that corroborated those victims. So, so it's things like, like Franklin, and then you've got the Jimmy Seville case that's going on in the UK right now where, where pedophilia has gone all the way up to the top of the food chain politically in the UK. And there's been the Dutro scandal in Belgium. Portugal has had one. Venezuela has had one. Mexico has had one. Um, there's been a number of these type of scandals where the rich and the powerful have uh, abused children and done, done so with impunity. Right. And I believe it was a, a whole separate case that even got you to start entertaining how dark these things can, can get. I believe it was a there was a group called the Finders, which was a satanic cult that slipped up and got their whole ring kind of uh, under the spotlight for a while. Yeah, the Finders is what got me into all this. I came across the Finders. I was working on a, uh, an article for on the occult for a magazine, and um, I came across a find, the Finders uh, U.S. Customs Report. What happened there was there were... Uh, Two members of the Finders, which is a very strange cult, and they were in a Tallahassee park with six children. And the children looked very severely abused, and a concerned citizen called the Tallahassee Police Department on the Finders. And um, the Tallahassee Police Department took one look at the situation, and uh, they arrested the two finders and then put the six kids in uh, protective custody. And a doctor said that uh, one of the kids, the, the kids were like three to six years old, I believe, and um, a doctor said that one of the kids you know, definitely showed signs of sexual abuse, and they found child pornography in the van that the finders were driving. And ultimately what happened was the finders had a couple of warehouses in Washington, D.C. And the D.C.'s Metropolitan Police Department and um, the U.S. Customs descended, or got a search warrant and descended upon these warehouses where they found just unbelievable types of incriminating evidence. I, I start the book out with the finders. And, uh, and actually, I include the entire U.S. Customs report at the back of the book, just to show people that it actually exists. But the finders were actually, there was documentation of the finders actually buying children. And as I looked into this realm, the sale of children is actually, unfortunately, a, a reality. And, um, but ultimately what happened, so you had a multi-level jurisdiction investigation into the finders. You had, uh, U.S. Customs, Metropolitan Police, Tallahassee Police, and uh, the FBI was somewhere in the mix. And ultimately, the CIA quashed the whole investigation into the finders. And the two finders, who had been charged with multiple counts of child abuse by Florida authorities, were let out of jail. And, th and then the kids, unbelievably, were repatriated to the finders. So that's what got me into this whole uh, world. I just... When I read that finder's document, I thought that there must be something in the world that I'm completely whiffing on if something like this is happening. Mm -hmm. And that and that document essentially started my dark odyssey into uh, into the world of organized child trafficking. Yeah, and to quote from your book there, the, the documents that pertained to blood rituals and orgies regarding children and the purchase of a kid in Hong Kong through a contact at the embassy. And that, again, is just kind of ridiculous that you could go through such a high-end official channel to get children. I mean, and these are just the small amount of details that we have. It's got to be pretty ridiculous, the things we don't know. Well, I think it's beyond ridiculous. It's uh, nefarious. But yes, I mean, that document is very incriminating. 
and what got me was you obviously had a group that was had some very strange, strange rituals and practices that were obviously doing malevolent things to children. And ultimately, the CIA quashes an investigation. Now, the CIA does not have any domestic jurisdiction, so they shouldn't have been able to quash that investigation to begin with. Right. And that really, that document was kind of like a big bang to me. It just woke me to uh, how horrific and nefarious large-scale child trafficking can be and, and, and who's protecting it and how it's protected. And to say one thing that's slightly positive is there have been a couple of cases where in certain states, uh, certain pockets of the FBI did do the right thing. And certain pockets of law enforcement actually did carry out full, honest investigations and trials under some of these networks, right? Well, I think in the Epstein case, the FBI in Florida refused to recover, uh, to cover that up and the department of justice covered it up. So that was, that was a good thing that the Florida Miami FBI refused to take part in the Jeffrey Epstein cover up. And it, the onus of that cover up ultimately fell on the department of justice, which it certainly had enough power to cover it up. But, uh, yeah, in that situation, you see the FBI doing the right thing. Yeah, it, and that definitely seems to be the minority of cases where they do the right thing. But like you did say, the Department of Justice really always seems to be the one to quash this stuff, right? Would you say they're the organization most guilty of suppressing this kind of thing? Well, uh, the Department of Justice ultimately tells other law enforcement branches what to do in most cases. And they're ultimately the one that can form the grand juries that can exonerate the guilty, the corrupt grand juries. So in a lot of cases, in the, in, in the Franklin case, you certainly, the Department of Justice was certainly the bellwether in the cover-up, the bellwether in Nebraska and also in Washington, D.C. The dirty work was done by the FBI in Nebraska and in Washington, D.C., the dirty work was done by the uh, Secret Service. In the Finders case, that was quashed before the CIA was able to quash it, even before it went to the Department of Justice. So um, the Department of Justice was kind of out of the mix there. And in the Epstein case, which I've investigated over the years, it was the Department of Justice that actually covered it up immaculate. So, yes, uh, the Department of Justice is responsible for a lot of this, the pedophile network cover ups that I've investigated. Yeah, I guess you could say they work similarly to an editor or a producer in media because the way these things are is you don't have to have every single reporter corrupt and in the know and hiding this information. You just need to get the editor of the paper or the producer of the media channel because they are the gatekeepers to what can get on the air. In the same way, there's a parallel, I guess, to the way the Department of Justice sets the tone for investigations. And as long as you have them you know, they're going to be able to get the attention off some of these cases and put people onto other things if that's their desire. Absolutely. It's important to have people at pivotal positions. And in the Franklin case, some of the people that took part in this on the law enforcement side were pedophiles, compromised pedophiles themselves. And I think in other cases, they were just people that just wanted to climb the ladder. Uh, so I think you, you, you end up with two types of people. Uh, people that are compromised themselves, and then people that just want to get to head, want to get ahead. Yeah, turn a blind eye and know that it'll benefit them regardless. Yeah, we're getting close to the end here. I know you got to get out of here. And we, you mentioned the UK pedophile scandal, which of course is big now. We all know also about the Penn State Jerry Sandusky situation. But and it's been a while since you wrote this book and have been looking into these things, but. Do you have any indication of how vast or integrated these rings are in the present day? I can only assume that a situation like this gets worse and worse over time as it becomes more apparent that it's very tough to ever get caught doing this. Well, I would say wherever there's a, it's just simple economics. Wherever there's a demand, there's a supply. The thing is, uh, pedophilia exists in all social strata. I mean, there are people that are extremely poor, impoverished, that are molesting children. 
And then with the Franklin scandal and Epstein and other scandals with Jimmy Seville, um, you've got the, the rich molesting children. Where, where the big difference there is that the rich seem to molest children with impunity, whereas the poor or the impoverished, uh, they're not as, you know, they get the book thrown at them and, and spend decades in prison. Right, right. I know you had mentioned in the beginning that the first Bush administration would have been in a lot of trouble had this stuff come to light. I know that there have been uh, senators that were named in your book that were involved in using these services. And of course, one of the victims, I believe it's the same, uh, Alicia Owen, was impregnated by a police chief. Can you tell us, any in closing, a little bit about the people who were using these services? I mean, we got senators, police chiefs, and apparently a lot of people in the first Bush administration. Yeah, I think that uh, some of the abusers of these kids, as I said earlier, went all the way up the food chain, the political food chain. And um, it's uh, the names that have come up are, are quite mind-boggling in my investigation as far as the exalted status of some of these perpetrators. But getting back to our conversation earlier, these kids, their credibility is so decimated because of the choices that they've made because of being molested repeatedly at a young age and then, and then the drug addiction. Um, that it's almost impossible to name names because some of these guys are just so exalted. The only way that you can really discern how powerful these people are is to look at all the power that was used to cover up this pedophile network. Uh, three corrupt grand juries, the Washington Post, the New York Times, CBS, the Omaha World Herald. Uh, there were a number of of media entities, too, that were used to cover this up. So we're talking about, in addition to the media entities, we're talking about the Department of Justice, the FBI, the Secret Service, the Omaha Police Department, Douglas County Judiciary, Washington, D.C. Judiciary. And uh, so it, it gets to be kind of, when you, when you look at all the power that was deployed to just vaporize this, to make sure that it didn't get traction. Um, I mean, that's how you can tell that the strings were being pulled at the pinnacle of power. Mm -hmm. And one other thing I wanted to bring up before we got out of here was, uh, I know in this realm, uh, well, a lot of people who talk about these things also are very quick to bring up trauma-based mind control, and that doesn't come up a lot in your book until the epilogue, I believe. What would you say about that element of these kind of cases? Is it as prevalent as people say? Is it more of a background role? If your readers want to, or your listeners want to learn about that, I would have them Google the extreme abuse survey. And that was a survey that was conducted uh, about six years ago, seven years ago. And it looked at people with uh, backgrounds in mind control. And actually, it's a very large study. There were over a thousand participants. And if your listeners really want to glean some pretty uh, pragmatic, corroborated evidence of mind control that's being used. Uh, I think that that's a good place to start is the Extreme Abuse Survey. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Um, that does about do it for us. On behalf of humanity, I cannot thank you enough for your dedication that you've had on this case and this topic and at the risk of your own safety. It's more noble than the work of almost anyone I know. It's truly an honor to have you here and to be able to just do a small part in helping get these types of things exposed in a real way. Can you tell the listeners where they could go to get your book? Uh, you can go to my website, franklinscandal.com or Amazon or Barnes & Noble. There's multiple modalities where you can purchase the book. Perfect. And you also mentioned a, a more recent one about the DC Madam. Yes, I... Uh... Henry Vince and I collaborated on a book. It's called Confessions of a DC Man and the Politics of Sex, Lies, and Blackmail. And it's about the blackmail operation run by Craig Spence. It's about Henry's life story, but it focuses quite heavily on the blackmail operation run by Craig Spence in Washington, DC. Perfect. And that's a really compelling part of the story. So I'm probably going to dig into that one soon myself. But this has been awesome. Thanks again, Nick. We need more people like you. Take care of yourself out there. Okay, thanks, Craig. You got it. 
There we have it, guys. A super interesting and sad saga, and your Exhibit A in the case that none of these official organizations or authorities can be trusted. And you cannot respect the law when it does not hold everyone accountable. We have some seriously systemic problems, and if we don't examine situations like this one, even though it's an older case, you and I can't drive that point home to regular people. So I hope this episode gives you a little ammunition for that. And if you enjoyed it, I would really urge you to shoot Nick a thank you, share this episode with some people that you think might be interested, and if you really want to go the extra mile, buy one of Nick's books. I would say The Franklin Scandal, if not just out of respect for his boldness in publishing the sealed grand jury testimony, I mean, that's baller in itself, and a good reason to put it on your bookshelf. Or, of course, his more recent book, Confessions of a DC Madam, if you want to hear more about the blackmail angle. I can plug THC Plus next time, but really, if you got the extra cash, it's Nick who deserves some support. I know anybody dealing with medical issues could probably use some spare change, and the work he's doing has been so noble that there should be some positive karmic effect for him, I would hope. Either way, that is it for me today, people. Not exactly sure what's next, but I got a lot more coming at you before the end of this month. So thanks for listening. I've done my part. Your move, child traffickers of the nefarious elite. Your frickin' move. Sweet dreams to the elite. We're calling them out on THC. Uncovering secrets and conspiracies. Everybody's looking for something. Some of them want to use you. Some of them want to get used by you Some of them want to abuse you Some of them want to be abused